guest today is Paul McDonald. He is a retired professor emeritus from psychology at the University of New Brunswick Confederican, specialist in autism spectrum disorder, and has a musical side to him too, which we'll explore later on in the show. Confidence. Yes, that's really true. Yeah, and her social confidence. And that was the thing, you know, she really was, she had picked up how to do social stuff, you know, how to, how to, how to talk to me, you know, where should I hang my coat, you know, mm. would you like some music, you know, isn't that amazing, you know, yes. so that's, and I think that's what a lot of us feel when we work in this field, that when you have an intervention technique that you use, and it works, and you see that child learning, mm. that is pretty darn exciting, mm. we love that. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks. Which then gets to, the next step is that, so we have the tools, and we have some of the people. Mm -hmm. So, um, in your view, how is New Brunswick doing with application implementation of this program? Um, in doing some of the homework for the show, there's some newspaper articles. If people wanted to Google Paul McDonald, they'll find um, a couple in the past year or so, mm -hmm. which ties to, <clears throat> um, to the turn towards government. We have this tool, and we have an inclusion strategy to some degree mm -hmm. in the province. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still not firing on all cylinders. And government, probably, uh, in their perspective, they get all these requests from so many different areas, they'll kind of zero everybody out and say everybody's asking for the same thing. Right. I've always wanted to flip the paradigm around, because um, mm. that's one of, we don't have enough, we don't have enough, rather than we've got everything we need. Right. <laughs> we just yeah. need to put it together a different yeah. way. So past guests on the show, um, I've spoken to, like Karen Lake, for example, she knows we could create 3,000 jobs tomorrow for in-home care mm -hmm. for seniors, yeah, yeah. which would then have a net benefit for the hospitals and for mm -hmm. senior care homes by keeping people in their home longer. Right, right. But it might be perceived by the government that here's somebody else thinking they've got the solution to mm -hmm. a problem and it's going to cost money, mm -hmm. rather than putting it through the whole analysis yes. to see what happens at the end. You do need to people. do that. <laughs> yes. So I'm, I'm <clears throat> assuming that you might have a similar experience model mm -hmm. solution Can well you? well there are um there have been a number of cost benefit studies done uh involving autism treatment and consistently those studies have shown that there are significant savings over the lifetime of an individual if you invest in in early intervention uh, for autism in fact all autism services produce a net benefit and that actually reduces the amount of money the taxpayers ultimately pay. However, there is an upfront cost. You have to you have to invest in it in the beginning to get the system up and running, and that costs a significant amount of money. And then as time goes on, you reap the benefits down the road. And uh, but there are some outstanding studies that have been done in this area, and 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 they're they're really excellent studies. There was one done at the. Um, uh, at the House for Sick Children in Toronto uh, several years ago, which uh, showed that typically, if you look at do doing the intervention as opposed to not doing the intervention, you would save over the course of an individual's life approximately $800,000, roughly, for taxpayers per person. Uh, so, Looking at that, uh, and, and there have been studies in the, in the United States that have done this as well. There's, uh, there's several other in, 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 in the States, and, and, and one other one I can think of in Canada as well that have, have, have demonstrated this. So it's, it's, I think, fairly well documented that this is a good investment, that it's worth spending the money like this. So in the case of New Brunswick, I mean, we have, uh, I, I'm really, I'm really proud of the province, you know, because I think, I think we've actually done pretty darn good job, you know. I mean, uh, I, we're, we're not there. I mean, obviously, there's a lot that needs to be done. But but if you look at other jurisdictions, I think we're ahead of the game in many, compared to some of the other provinces. And that's, that's exciting, I think, and satisfying. Um, early intervention, the preschool intervention program, we have a comprehensive early intervention program in the problem in the province. It's wonderful because access is so good. So when a child is diagnosed within several months, they're in a program. If you contrast that to the province of Ontario, you'll see a dramatic difference where there is huge wait times to get into programs in Ontario, unless they've changed it very recently, but certainly that was the case. Um, and so, um, 
and in some of the other provinces there's virtually no services. So uh, what we have here at the early intervention stage is very good and I think it's very worth doing because it's actually producing good outcomes and it's really working. Um, so, uh, and, and it's good because, I mean, a, a, say a child is picked up uh, around 18 months to 24 months, which is not unusual in terms of diagnosis, and then um, within several months they're into a program, and they can stay in that program until they enter into kindergarten. So that program is ABA-based, it's evidence-based. The individuals who are delivering the treatment is a company called Autism Intervention Services. Uh, and uh, the government provides the funding and the, uh, the company provides the services. And they have, they're highly trained. They have uh, individuals who run it who have, are certified behavior analysts. So they've gone through, uh, they're all uh, typically either speech language pathologists or occupational therapists or psychologists who have gone the extra mile and done the extra training to become certified behavior analysts, which is, <clears throat> which is great. And uh, <clears throat> so they have, a, they have uh, the qualifications to do the job. And, and the intervention programs that we've observed, that we see, are, seem to be working extremely well. But after you leave, leave <clears throat> the preschool level, children go into the school. Now, a few years ago, um, the Department of Education uh, took over the preschool program. It was in Department of Social Services, but, but in order to... Uh, make things work more fluidly, they put it all into education, which seems to have worked. I think it's, 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 it seems like a good idea because uh, you have one department then that's in charge. And it really, the intervention program really is education. It's really what it is. That's what you're doing. You know? So it makes a lot of sense. And, um, but the Department of Education has done a really cool thing. Uh, what they've done is developed uh, an online training program for teachers, for educational assistants, uh, and also for the teachers. And the, this is a really uh, excellent online training tool. And it has several levels to it. Um, there's a practicum for uh, if you wish to do it, uh, which is incredibly important, I think, in this field. And uh, um, they, um, uh, uh, this, this, this online program is seen as an excellent program not only by us here in the province but also by the other Atlantic provinces. So all of the other Atlantic provinces have adopted our program that was made here in New Brunswick, which is kind of nice to hear. And uh, so they're using it to varying degrees, but I know that around the Atlantic provinces typically they're enrolling about a thousand teachers a year. So the it, within the field of education in the schools, the level of understanding of how to teach children with autism is dramatically improving, I think, as time goes along. And uh, we're getting teachers with more and more education. And many of them are becoming certified behavior analysts. Certainly resource teachers are doing that. And uh, so, so this is all very encouraging. How long has this been going on? I would say that program's been there maybe not very long, uh, about three years. Yeah, about three years, I think, now. One of the themes that yeah. consistently comes up, especially when in <clears throat> conversations with politicians, yeah. is asking the politician, can you live with a 20-year solution to your four-year election cycle? Mm. Because quite often policies are driven by the four-year election cycle. Absolutely. And we're in yeah. the throes of that right now in New Brunswick. But what you just mapped out, if that was allowed to just keep doing what it's doing mm. and let it keep growing the way it's growing, three mm. years old to five years old to 10 years old to 20, yeah, it would have a significant impact um, Absolutely. all, all it will. through. Yeah, I think it will. Yeah. So do you think it'll be <clears throat> left alone or can this become an example where maybe we can let the political mindset recognize that your role is governance, not power, and mm -hmm. some things are left to go full fruition. Yeah, yeah. I certainly, well, I guess I just hope so, you know, <laughs> uh, because I, I see the, you know, the, the, this, this type of online training as, as a practical way to go about uh, increasing the critical thinking level of people who work with people with autism. They understand yeah. the situation so much better. And um, <clears throat> it's not the, the only the final solution necessarily, but it's certainly uh, an excellent, excellent effort. So I think it's really good that we 
done that. I think this is this is why I'm very. This is the the part that I'm really happy about in New Brunswick that we've accomplished. You know, we need to do more, obviously. So, for instance, in the preschool program, probably what we need is more hours of intervention for some of the children. So we tend to have have a twenty hour intervention number. Mm-hmm. Everybody gets twenty hours. But everybody doesn't need 20 hours. Some people need more, some need less, you know. So, I mean, it, it would make sense to have more flexibility and to uh, titrate the intervention to suit the individual. Which I think it brings up an, an important issue, which is that, uh, you know, it, it, the field of autism is unique in that the individuals are unique. And the kind of intervention that each individual needs is unique. And when we design a program for a child on the spectrum, we have to really not just give them a generic program, we have to actually figure out, well, what are the, what are the, the top three things this particular child needs to learn right now? And that's what we need to teach them. And that will be different from another child and another child. And so this is where the classroom becomes a bit of an obstruction because in a classroom, it typically, the whole point is you have a teacher walk in and there's 20 kids there and and the teacher teaches 20 of them the same stuff. Well, that doesn't work. That's, that's good enough maybe for some of your typical kids, but it isn't necessarily good enough for children on the spectrum. We really need to say that this, this boy or this girl needs a particular program and we need to figure out what are the uh, target behaviors that we should be identifying and then how are we going to teach those target behaviors to that child? Because that's the uh, the way it works. So there, that's where the you know the the challenges I think in a in a system which is delivering sort of one shoe fits all uh, approach to uh, uh, you know to designing it in, in, at the one on one level, which is really what you need for autism. Uh, however, you know, I mean, I, I'm saying that. I mean, I realize, I recognize that the, the, the schools are trying their best. I mean, they do try very hard, and the teachers are are really t- trying to to tailor programs so that the child with any kind of a disability is is, is getting what they need. Obviously, though, they they are challenged to do that. I think, yeah. Well, what you're mapping out about the tailor made program for each um, individual student in the ABA program, but in a classroom structure. Mm in some ways reminds me of coaching. Um, mm-hmm. You can have a team, and you've got 50 athletes on a football team, mm-hmm. and every one of them comes with a certain skill set. Yeah. And somehow you have to mold them in, into a team, but each of them, you know, some need to work on their footing, some need to work on understanding the play. Right. <laughs> some right. need to know where they fit into the pattern, because when you come from X's and O's on the board to being on the field, yeah. it doesn't at all <laughs> look doesn't the translate. same. Yeah, yeah for know? sure. Yeah. So yeah. it's all the same learning challenges, yeah. socialization challenges. And it's a wandering thought, but would the ABA program, I know it's geared for uh, autistic youth, but there has to be some elements in the teaching of it that mm-hmm. would also apply to the whole class. Oh, yeah. Oh, it does. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'm just riffing a bit, but wouldn't it be interesting mm-hmm. if teachers were using some of that playful, adaptive structure while trying to get 20 students to a certain level in comprehension of mathematics or a certain level of skill set in languages. Mm-hmm. Sort of integrate the other way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, right, sense. yeah, reverse integration. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, sometimes our language gets in the way of, of where we're trying to go because we tend to put things in labels and boxes. That's right. For yeah. the sake of getting there, trying to get mm. some understanding to yeah. it. So there's a good intent. Yeah, absolutely. But then it stops at a certain point where we we can't get it to, to yeah, fit. So right. it needs a new language sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It through. Yeah, the um, uh, I I don't know the um, uh, see uh, applied behavior analysis is sort of designed um, to optimize the learning. So it targets things like, for instance, what, what you would do if you're actually doing this. You identify a skill you want this child to learn, and then you set up. Uh, opportunities to to learn and you provide motivation you, you spend a lot of time working on how to get this child motivated to actually want to learn you know basically so that's a key thing so to some extent those principles do apply to a whole classroom and I don't think you I, I still don't think you can deviate from the 
from the uh, role of, uh, or from the, the, the and, and you're never going to get back to a point where you, the classroom is all getting the same thing, even if it was ABA. <laughs> it wouldn't necessarily work because you still need to identify. The, the, the skills that that child with autism need to learn are really substantively different than the skills that the other children need to learn, probably. And yes. even if, even when they're at the same level, sometimes that is the case. Yeah. So you may have a very high-functioning individual with Asperger's syndrome, or what we call Asperger's syndrome, because the, 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 the diagnostic labels have changed lately. Um, but uh, uh, that person still may have challenges that are not necessarily the same as the typical kid in the class. So that we have, that's the reality we have to kind of work around. But hmm. I, I get your point. I think that's an interesting idea, yeah. you know. It was more for <laughs> the teachers and administrators than yeah. for, you know. The well, in a sense, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> if you see a well-run uh, class that is run on behavioral principles and that is uh, 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 really excellent, uh, you see kids who are just learning incredibly well. And it has nothing to do with autism. It's just, it's just good teaching. It's yes. just that essentially that's what it is. But um, I remember one day I went to uh, look at a school in, New in um, Massachusetts, and, uh, and it was a, a, a school that had 60 children with autism in it, which is really interesting because we don't have those here. <laughs> this is a private, private institute. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, one of the classrooms they had there was a kindergarten, and it was a reverse integrated kindergarten. And, uh, and, and of course, in that kindergarten, they had excellent teachers, they had speech language pathologists, they had occupational therapists, they had, they had really solid professionals in there, right? And so this was an amazing kindergarten class, right? And I was standing at the door watching the kids in that room and I said, I can't tell the difference between, the, because this is a reverse integrate, so there were typical kids there, right? So I couldn't tell the difference between the typical kids and the kids with autism. Mm -hmm. And one of the fathers of a typical kid said, he said, you know what, he said, this is the best kept secret in Boston. There's all these people, they won't bring their kid to this reverse integrated class, but look at this class, he says, it's phenomenal. It's yeah. so well run. It's so, these kids are all learning at such an active rate, and that's, that's what you want to get at, you know. It's that, it's the rate of learning that's so important, you know, to address in this whole issue. Mm -hmm. The challenge is that left to their own devices, your typical child with autism is going to learn at an extraordinarily slow rate. And what we're trying to do with our interventions is up that rate substantially. That's the goal. Yeah. If you'll indulge me and prep for this, um, I thought, gee, I wonder what. Um, you would think about this. So it's Oliver Sacks' book oh, yes, called I'm An Anthropologist. Aware of him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a section about Temple Grandin, and it ties to learning. So I put it here in prep, thinking maybe we get there, maybe you don't, mm. and we're here. Mm. So to read a little section, um, yeah. Temple Grandin asks, How do you think? She kept asking me, but she had no sense that she could draw, make blueprints until she was 28, when she met a draftsman and watched him drawing plants. I saw how he did it, she told me. I went and got exactly the same instruments and pencils he used, a 0.5 millimeter HB Pentel, and then I started pretending I was him. The drawing did itself. And when it was all done, I couldn't believe I'd done it. I didn't have to learn how to draw a design. I pretended I was David. I appropriated him, drawing and all. Hmm. Does that... Resonate? Yeah. Does that kind of make yeah. sense? Well, Temple Grandin is an amazing person. Bit of an exception. As we all know. But she communicated a yeah. shift in a perception yeah. and explained a process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's really interesting, yeah. Yeah, she's describing what she did, yeah. and, it, and it worked. And, and of course, uh, she is famous for her ability to design animal uh, handling equipment and that yeah, sort of thing, you know, and uh, and that was must have been her first her first go at it, I guess. I hadn't actually I hadn't read that particular quote. At least I don't remember it anyway. <laughs> but it's a, it's really good. Yeah, isn't yeah. it? Because I thought, my goodness, this would pop up just before yeah. we're going to have our conversation, yeah. and I thought, so she's explaining how she did it. Just what, out of curiosity, she's speaking in Moncton. Uh, I think very soon on the sixteenth or seventh. Yeah, I think it's sixteenth, maybe of March. Of March, and I think it's in 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 Moncton, uh, and uh, but she's she's a wonderful speaker. Uh, I've heard her many times, and uh, and uh, she she she's brilliant, and she really understands 
uh, the differences between autism and, and the typical world, and she's uh, she's very good at articulating that. I think. So, yeah, builds yeah. a bridge for us. So she builds a bridge. She builds it just like she did in that quote. Uh, yeah. She she builds a bridge for yeah. us absolutely. So back to New Brunswick um, school system, media, and even Nova Scotia right now. Come to think of it, because there's a kerfuffle going on between the government and the teachers union, and it has to do with a particular study. And I mm-hmm. think somewhere in their mm-hmm. inclusion is one of the. Right. Themes that's getting banged out again. And it always seems like a tug of war instead yeah. of a dance. Yeah, exactly. That's a good, <laughs> good way to put it. And it shouldn't be a tug of war. It should be a dance. Yeah. yeah. The, the, um, and we've got something cooking here in New Brunswick, as, mm. you, as you've taught us. Mm. But media will talk about how uh, understaffed some of the schools are. Um, mm. They'll talk about the challenges that come up with an integrated classroom with uh, five ability levels here and four over here in the teacher trying to cope with that. Yeah, um, absolutely. When it comes yeah. to teaching assistants, so uh, I often hear about there's not enough hours. You're not mm-hmm. giving us enough hours, which then yeah. slides to budgets, which then yeah. slides yeah. to that we don't have enough culture. Yeah. Um, and you've lived right in the mm. intersection of a lot of that mm. for a while. Do you see ways out of that dynamic? Is there a different conversation we could be having that actually gets us over the hump? Um. Yeah, they, I mean, it's been sort of uh, a perception that there's inclusion and then there's not inclusion, you know, and there, there has to be something sort of... I mean, you know, the thing about inclusion is that it's a philosophy, it's not a method. You know, it's, it's an ideal, it's what you want. It's what we all want. Uh, we want all of our people, children, to uh, be able to interact in the world to, to the greatest extent possible. You know, we, we want them to do as much as they can and go where they can go and that sort of thing. So we want to make the world as rich and as uh, interesting and as diverse as we can possibly do. That's sort of what inclusion is about. But the question is, how do you do it? You know, mm-hmm. It may be that you might have to start off with a more restricted environment in the beginning if you want to get that person to that, that state, to that end goal. Mm-hmm. But you can't necessarily start there. You know, So we have to start where we're at, where the child is at. And I think that... The phrase I would use is uh, that's really important is that I think every child deserves a meaningful education. You know? And it's not meaningful to take a child with severe impairments and put them into a class where they're doing uh, algebra and, and the child has no clue what is going on in that environment or that world. Uh, so that child deserves to have something that's meaningful to that person at that age at that time you know that's what we need to do yeah. so that's again I think applied behavior analysis is good because essentially what we do is we identify the target behaviors that are appropriate for this child right now and we then go about figuring out okay how are we going to teach them and we're going to get the job done and, and so that's important I think but meaningful education is important I think be good have fun Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon.